Hello, everybody, and welcome. We are so excited to have you here with us today for episode 122 of ASBN Live. On behalf of the American Sustainable Business Network, I am Tulsi Sivalingam, the Manager of Events and Programming, and I'm excited for this conversation between two visionary business leaders. Alan Murray is the CEO of Fortune Media and author of the forthcoming book, which actually was just released, Tomorrow's Capitalist, My Search for the Soul of Business. Prior to joining Fortune in 2015, Murray led the Pew Research Center. Before that, he was at the Wall Street Journal for many years. Alan will be interviewed by Jeffrey Hollander, ASBN CEO and co-founder. He was co-founder and CEO of Seventh Generation, which he built into a leading natural product brand known for its authenticity, transparency, and progressive business practices. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, I'd now like to turn it over to you to lead this conversation. Thank you so much. And again, Alan, we're thrilled to have you here with us. Love to dive into discussing your great book and love to start by focusing on your subtitle. Your subtitle is My Search for the Soul of Business. And my first question is, did you find it? I think I found the inklings of it. Look, we can dive into this in more uh, detail, Jeffrey, but I, I, I think what's been happening over the last few decades, and you were certainly a part of this movement, is that, that businesses are becoming more human organizations, which wasn't really true in the 20th century. There was much more about accumulated capital, physical capital, oil in the ground, inventory on the shelves. But now value is cre so clearly created by human capital and by talent that they need to become more human organizations. And human organizations have values. And I suspect in some sense, they have a soul. So I, 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 I think you are seeing the kind of development of a soul of business happening here over the course of the 21st century. You know, when I think about business priorities and the way in which those business priorities are shifting. One of the things that always troubled me, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on it, is the amount of money that companies spend buying back their own stock. And uh, by many accounts, they're spending more money buying back their own stock than they are spending on research and development and other critical priorities like their employees wonder what you think about that trend and how that aligns or doesn't align with this new soul of business. I, I, it's an interesting question. I think it's a bit of a side question. I mean, when a company buys back its stock, what it's basically saying is, I can't think of anything useful to do with this money, so I'm going to give it back to my investors. In my view, that's not necessarily a bad thing unless, unless, it's motivated by a, uh, a formula for increasing their own compensation. And then you have to say, well, why the heck should I be paying you more if you can't think of anything to do with the money I've given you? You know, I mean, I, sure, I'll take it and invest it someplace else, but why should it be tied to your compensation? So to me, the key question about buybacks is, do you, do, do you extract that increase in the, in the uh, stock value from any compensation scheme, and many companies do not. Um, but but I, I guess the other issue is it, it is sort of a sign of a lack of of uh, creativity and vision. You know, are are there not ways you can employ that capital to solve the problems of people and planet? I I, I think it's a question worth asking. Yeah. Because, you know, on a related note, uh, after the Business Roundtable issued its statement about a new focus on stakeholders as opposed to shareholders, which is something that we'll want to dive into yeah. during the course of the interview, the Times looked at a bunch of those companies that are members of the Business Roundtable and wrote a sort of questioning article about why they were paying dividends while they were letting lots of employees go. And what did it mean that the dividends seemed to be more important 
than the staff that were about to lose their jobs. I don't know if you remember that article. Yeah, I do. I do. It's it, it, it's a it's a reasonable question. Look, I don't think anyone thinks that stakeholder capitalism means you should never lay off employees. Um, uh, uh, there, there are clearly times when your company is shrinking. I mean, look at look at what happened to the airlines during the pandemic, right? Where their business dropped by ninety five percent. They had no choice but to furlough employees. Sure, their business was gone. So, but but I do think one of the things that is happening now, and I think it's a good thing, is that there is more attention to, geez, is there is there a better alternative here? Can we? Is there a retraining option? Is there uh, are, are there things we can do to ameliorate or minimize the impact? But it's not going to mean that layoffs never happen again. No, of course not. Of course not. In all of the conversations you had, and 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 for those of you that haven't read the book, one of the really enjoyable parts of the book are how many people Alan has talked to, and how many different perspectives he's gathered. Wondering what you found that most surprised you. What 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 didn't you expect to hear from some of these business leaders? Yeah, well, I should say first of all, this was sort of an evolutionary process for me uh, over the course of the last twenty years. And Jeffrey, you were a part of this history, so you're well aware of it. And I guess I was I was struck recently. Uh, uh, David Gellis recently came out with a book on Jack Welch that I read uh, and, and you know, I knew Welch, I had interviewed Welch, but I, I think what I had sort of lost track of was how dramatically different running a big company like that at the end of the 20th century was from running a big company now. The way CEOs talk about their jobs, talk about their responsibilities, talk about their goals is just very different. Uh, and, and it's and it's different because they're because they're they feel compelled to talk much more about uh, the importance of talent, the importance of human relationships. We can dig into that in more detail. So I think the magnitude of the change in leadership that's happened over the course of 20, 30 years is very large and very compelling and to some degree surprising. The other thing that was in particular surprising to me was when the pandemic hit in March of 2020. And I'd been following this for a while and I had written about the business roundtable's decision to change its purpose of a corporation statement away from a shareholder focused statement to a multiple stakeholders, employees, customers, the communities they live in their environment. But when the pandemic hit and you suddenly realize the economy was going to tank as a result, um, my first instinct was, oh, all this talk about stakeholder capitalism is going to go away. It's going to be put on a back burner because the bottom line is deteriorating and they're going to have to focus on the bottom line. And I think the biggest surprise to me was that the exact opposite happened. And maybe it was kind of the nature of the crisis. It was a stakeholder crisis, but you, but companies actually paid more attention to their employees um, and even subsequently more attention to the environment, you saw a massive explosion in corporate commitments to reaching net zero by 2050 or before after the pandemic, which is not what I expected. And I think that's what gave me the sense that I really needed to write this book because this was not a fad, it was not a passing PR exercise. It was fundamental changes in the dynamics driving large companies. And I wanted to explore those fundamental changes. I think it's there, it, it's real, we can talk about it. It's not going away. Well, what is driving those fundamental changes? I mean, what what is the root cause yeah. of this transformation you're seeing? Yeah, so there are different pieces of it, but I'll tell you the single thing. Let me give you a single fact that helps you grasp how big this change is. If you look at the uh, balance sheets of the Fortune 500 corporations in 1970, 50 years ago, and you ask the question, where is the value coming from in these corporations? What you'll find is more than 80% of the value of Fortune 500 companies in, in the 1970s came from physical stuff. 
it was plant, equipment, oil in the ground, inventory on the shelf, all stuff that required financial capital to accumulate. And once you had accumulated it, you had the power, you had the ability to win. So in a way, it's kind of natural that during that period of time, uh, companies would particularly focus on the return to capital because capital was where the value was. If you do the same exercise today, look at the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies, what you'll find is more than 85% of the value today comes from intangibles. It's intellectual property, computer code, it's brand connection with uh, customers. It's all things that are much less tied to physical capital, much more tied to people. Uh, and so talent uh, and human relationships, whether it's with your employees or your customers um, or other stakeholders, have really become the main drivers of business value in today's world. And I think that is the fundamental reason. There are other reasons we can talk about, but that change right there is the fundamental reason why companies are acting so different today than they did 30 or 40 years ago, because they because the source of value is very different than it was. Right. So if we look at this issue, which is, from your perspective, in large part about talent and preservation of talent and attracting talent, is the new sort of eruption towards unionization at a number of large companies, a distraction from that? Or is there, is, is that suggesting a conflict in the transition to this new reality? Give, give us some context in terms of how you see this new set of labor issues. Yeah. It's a great question. Look, most every CEO, uh, most every CEO I know would rather operate without a union than with a union. I don't think that means inherently they don't care about the welfare of their workers. I think they think that the best way to have a high functioning company is to is to uh, is to treat your workers well and have them uh, feel part of a corporate whole. And you can easily lose that with unionization. Um, so so you look at what's happening at Starbucks, for instance. I mean, Starbucks is, has a, a long history of being a very uh, employee-focused company, but enough employees there decided they wanted to unionize that it really kind of disrupted that. And now the CEO is, the, Kevin Johnson was uh I don't know if he was kicked out, pushed out, or if he decided he had had enough, but Howard Schultz is now coming back in to try and restore. I think a big part of the reason he's coming back in is to restore that relationship with uh, customers. So um, uh, so I, I, I certainly understand that unionization is motivated by some of the inequities that built up over the course of the last 50 years. I just don't know many CEOs who think unions are are the best answer to creating better companies. It seems that we lost Jeffrey. I think he's having some technical issues. Sorry about that. Oh. Um, while I work to get him back on, Alan, is there anything else you just want to speak to or take this time to talk about the book? Yeah, well, well, maybe I can just give a little background to how I got to this point because sure. While I'm while I'm currently CEO of Fortune Media, I, I really spent most of my life as a journalist. I started working as a journalist literally when I was nine years old. I walked up and down the street and took notes on people's lost dogs and visiting grandmothers and printed it up and sold it for a nickel. So um, it, it, it has been my life's work. And I guess I've always thought of myself more explaining society than trying to change it. Um, uh, and I know Je Jeffrey has been part of, of trying to change business. Jeffrey, I was just, I was just telling a little bit about how I got here. Uh, uh, give me two minutes to finish the story. So, so I, I really didn't go at this, uh, saying, boy, I'm going to change business. I went in and saying, I want to explain what's going on. And over the course of the last 
10, 15 years, I just started hearing very different things in my conversations with CEOs. And I said, something different is happening here. Much of it happened after the Great Recession. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, I'm not sure when the American Sustainable Business Network started, but I think it was around 2010. Uh, 2008. 2008. Okay. And you may remember that year, Bill Gates gave a somewhat famous speech at Davos, uh, where he talked about the need for creative capitalism. Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School started talking about shared value capitalism. I, I, somewhere in there, John Mackey started talking about conscious capitalism. All of a sudden, in the wake of the Great Recession, which was this huge market failure, you heard a lot of credible voices putting modifiers in front of capitalism, uh, say, hey, we need to figure out a way to do this better. And as a reporter and in having many of these conversations, I felt that drumbeat continued to increase throughout the decade. There were some significant events in 2016 we can talk about where there was a, a, a big building, but really pretty steadily continued to increase until there was so much going on. I thought, you know, this is, and then in some ways it was ratified by the Business Roundtable adopting its new purpose of the corporation statement in August of 2019. At that point, I said, there's something fundamentally different going on here in the way business leaders are talking about thinking about managing their businesses and thinking about their obligations to the broader society. Uh, and, and that's what got me to dive into the topic. Right. In terms of this new sensibility that you have so articulately described, where do you think senior management and CEOs in particular are struggling the most with this change that they're experiencing? Yeah, let, let me give a few answers to that question. Uh, first of all, I think if you ask them that question and they were candid with you, they would tell you this, that what has become very difficult in this world they live in, in part, they're motivated by the failure of politics, right? Our political system has broken down. And so a lot of times CEOs feel like they have to step up to deal with an issue like inequality or climate change or, or uh, 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 equity, social equity, because the political system is failing so badly. But at the same time, what I find in most of the CEOs I talk to, on the one hand, they're on board for this notion that businesses need to have values and they need to stand up for their values. But at the same time, they almost universally feel like, but God, please keep me out of political battles because the political process has become so counterproductive, so polarized. And by the way, I care about my employees and my customers, and I have employees and customers on both sides of most of these divisive political questions. And, and I think that's hard because, you know, if you if you say you have values and you say you need to speak up for values, but those values lead you into a political thicket, what are you supposed to do? That's what we saw with Disney CEO Bob Chappick in Florida. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of CEOs are wrestling with the Roe v. Wade question right now, saying, how do I deal with this? I don't want to get I don't want to be caught up in a in a political fight. So I think that's very uh, difficult for uh, for CEOs right now to figure out how they stand up for their values, but avoid getting caught up in counterproductive and even destructive political battles. How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> That's exactly the problem. I'm, I mean, to some extent you can't, but you also can't speak out on everything. I, I think what the best companies are doing are saying, okay, let's be very deliberate about this. What are the what are the values that really matter to us enough that we really have to speak out on them? A number of the tech companies, for instance, have been quite vocal on immigration, even though that's a controversial uh, uh, political issue. But but also limit yourself so you're not speaking out on every political issue because that that'll just uh, you, you, let me put it this way. I spent the first half of my career in Washington covering government. 
I, and the second half of my career directly covering business. I always looked at the intersection between business and government, but it was a pretty dramatic shift in my attention. Uh, and, and part of the reason I made the change was because the political system was just heading downhill. Even 20 years ago, it was heading downhill fast. You, the, the ability to find reasonable people of goodwill who wanted to come together and try and find practical solutions to problems as opposed to look for some talking point that they can use in the next election, just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And what, what's different about business leaders is by, by profession, they're problem solvers. By, they have to be pragmatists. They can't take the, uh, the, the uh, polarized view because that makes it impossible to solve problems. So I, I do think uh, business, business leaders have you know moved from defining the right wing of the political spectrum to defining the center of the political spectrum, and I think that's a good thing. Um, you you've made reference to the uh, dysfunctionality of the political process, and I guess I'd ask you to what extent business actually is making that worse, yeah, and what is their role in making it better. So I, I, you know, there are some people who would argue that the whole reason the political process is dysfunctional is because of business lobbying. Yes. As somebody who spent 20 years of my career in Washington, I don't really buy that. I don't think that's where the dysfunction is coming from. And I think the, the election of 2016 kind of proved that. I mean, who was in the battle between... Uh, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, who was representing business, no one on at least big business, no one on either either side of the equation. So I, 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 I don't buy the notion that Washington does whatever business wants them to do. I think to I think in recent years, they've become increasingly ineffective in Washington. Having said that, I think there are a few issues, you know, uh, taxes is a great example. Uh, if, if companies are saying they want to improve their positive impact on society and on stakeholders beyond shareholders, but at the same time, they have this lobbying arm off to the left whose job is just to absolutely minimize the tax burden on the company, no matter what, you do have to ask the question, well, wait a minute, are those two arms working in in concert? I mean, taxes is one of the most significant ways that companies contribute to the well-being of 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 society, so I, I, I there's certainly some conflict going on there, uh, but I don't think it's as fundamental a conflict as to say co companies are the reason that Washington is dysfunctional. Oh, and and so it, it just if I can just for a second to get to the second part of your question, yes, I think companies can do a lot more than they're doing to help solve the problem. Um, uh, you know, I think you saw some of that in the infrastructure debate. Uh, there have, uh, you saw a little bit of that in the police reform efforts. You had the, the CEO of AT&T in there. I'd like to see a lot more of that. Um, I'd like to see companies step up and, and use their new, the new trust that they've accumulated in society to help create a more functioning political system because you need both. Yeah. Well, let's, let's stay with this issue about taxes for a second, because one of the things that I worry about the most is a system that allows very large companies to avoid paying taxes, particularly federal taxes. And that places a greater burden on individuals and small businesses. And I just wonder about what kind of soul runs a company that avoids paying taxes for the very things that they need for their business to be successful? I think, I, I think it's a great question. Um, I think it's starting to change, but that but we're way behind on that one. I mean, I had one of the big, the heads of one of the big four accounting firms tell me that in the last year, for the first time, they've been having conversations with clients about tax strategies, asking not just, is that legal? Uh, but is that moral? 
is that the right thing to do? I think that's the right question. I think that's that if companies do have a soul, if companies do have values, if companies do truly care about their impact on society, they need to be asking that question. Is this tax strategy not just legal, but the right thing to do? But I think we're at the very beginning of that. Was that something that came up at all in your discussions with CEOs? Yeah, I've, I, I've, and, and, you know, I can point to a few CEOs who agree with me and some CEOs who say, you know, if we, we would, we'd be happy to, to come to some sort of reasonable agreement on that. Uh, you know, even if you go back and think about the Trump tax bill, um, uh, I think the business roundtable would have settled at a much more reasonable place than the Republicans in Congress ended up. Now, maybe that was because smaller businesses were putting pressure on them. Uh, uh, but I think in the in the in the Fortune 500 community, which are the CEOs I'm most familiar with, I think there was a willingness to come up with. Uh, um, more reasonable solutions. And you see a little bit of that in this discussion that Janet Yellen as Treasury Secretary has sparked around minimum tax. It's like, uh, can we can we work to eliminate the incentives that cause companies to to hide their profits overseas? Yeah, um, there there I, I know of large companies that have uh, helped in that effort. They're in favor of that, even though it increases their tax bill. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. So, small steps, baby steps. Yeah, I think, you know, I think this question of what's moral versus what's legal is a really important question as businesses begin to transform themselves into more caring, humane organizations. We've created some laws that are not so wonderful for society. And I think it's great that you're seeing businesses ask this question around morality and ethics, because I, I don't think society will ultimately hold business in great esteem if what they seek is where they can find a loophole to do something that they know they should really be doing. I, I, I totally agree. I think that's one. I think the other one that probably needs some thought and attention is is CEO pay. Um, uh, because, you know, when the CEO is making 300 times the average worker, irrespective of results, uh, the, the shareholders may not care. Often the shareholders, if they're getting a good return, they're happy to see the CEO make more. But it does undermine uh, uh, social trust at a time when I see in the chat somebody's asking the question about growing inequality. A time when inequality is growing, say, "Well, wait a minute." So we're supposed to expect this CEO who is is making 300, 400, 500 times his or her average employee to uh, address inequality? Uh, does that seem right? So I, I I think they're look. Let me let me. Let me put it this way, shareholder primacy, focusing on returns to the shareholder is a system that built up over a hundred years. Uh, and you know we have elaborate accounting infrastructure to support that. That's where the big four accounting firms came from. Every company has a huge finance uh, uh, departments that are focused on how do we measure return to shareholders. We've gotten very good at that. <laughs> it's not to say there aren't occasional accounting scandals, but we kind of know how to do that. This stakeholder movement is still very new, um, and, and it's going to take time to build up the same kind of metrics and measurement and accountability around stakeholder capitalism that we have around shareholders. So it's not going to happen overnight. I, I guess the reason I wrote the book is because I became convinced that directionally that's where we're headed and that it's not going to be a short-lived fad. It is being driven by fundamental changes in business that will keep pushing in that direction. Yeah. One of the challenges in this evolution as you say, is CEO compensation. And we have a system 
in some ways that encourage CEOs to do certain things to benefit their compensation that aren't always good for all stakeholders. You bet. How do we deal with that? I mean, uh, uh, regulations, laws, accounting standards, you and I have already talked about one. Uh, there may be times when it makes perfectly good sense for companies to do share buybacks as a means of returning money to shareholders. But it never makes sense, in my view, for the CEO's pay to be inflated because of that strategy. That's a pure cash transfer. You don't need an incentive to learn how to write a check. You should get, you should be incentivized to be to creatively create new value and and uh, di- uh, you know, share buybacks and dividends don't create new value. So you think there might be willingness on the part of Fortune 500 CEOs to actually support regulations that limit their ability to do that? I think some companies already do that. My understanding is IBM, for instance, already does that. I think some other companies already do that. That should be a standard and if, and, and it should probably be put in, in regulation. And look, I mean, the fear of every company is that as soon as you head down the regulation roads, the regulators overreact. So there's a natural uh, wariness of government regulation. But you, you see it right now in, the, in climate metrics. You, you have... Uh, uh, an explosion of companies, now a majority of Fortune 500 companies, who have made commitments to uh, net zero by 2050 or sooner. But some of those companies are more serious about getting there than others. And the ones who are serious about getting there say, say are saying, geez, it's not really fair that we're doing all of this and that other company is just greenwashing and not doing any of it. So many of those companies support the SEC getting involved in creating uh, reporting standards on climate so that there's some, so it's you don't live in a world where every company can pick its own metric uh, but that there's some standardization and accountability. So, I, you know, it's it, it's it's not, uh, as you know, it's not that uncommon for companies to embrace smart regulation if they think it can advance their own interests. Yes, and this again brings us to the very heart of the matter, which is, is their interest their stakeholders or is their interest their shareholders? And I think the transition from shareholders to stakeholders is, as you've described, a complex one yeah. that will take some years to sort of sort out. And, and, and we will never eliminate self-interest. So that's not the goal. The, uh, you know, to, if, if anyone dreams that somehow we can make people or, or companies act in a completely self-interested way, uh, they're not being realistic. But, but Jeffrey, what, what strikes me in these debates is a couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, that increasingly there are many opportunities to do what's good for society and what's good for your company at the same time. And so encouraging companies to seek out those opportunities uh, uh, has a positive effect. And so I think that's great. Um, you know, not many of them will flip over to the, hey, this is good for society, but it's going to be really bad for my company, uh, but I'll do it anyway. Um, but the other thing is that the more I looked at this, the more it became clear to me that any conflict between what's good for society and what's good for my shareholders tends to go away over the long term. I mean, you can think of there there are, I mean, I was in the C-suite of, a, of Time Inc. in its final days when it was under it was under activist shareholder pressure and was living quarter to quarter. It was always about like, where can we find a few more pennies to boost the quarterly results? And you can easily see lots of potential decisions that would be bad for society, but help you in the next quarter. But those tend to disappear over time. You know, you cannot be a successful company uh, if the world is on fire. You cannot be a successful company if society erupts in 
into civil war because of uh, inequality. You cannot, I, I just finished reading belatedly uh, Empire of Pain, which is the wonderful book on the Sackler family and, and its role in the opioid crisis. They made a lot of money over a 10 year period by pushing a very destructive product onto uh, uh, people without being honest about what the consequences were. So for a decade or more, that was a very profitable enterprise. But at the end of the day, everybody said, wait a minute, you've been pushing these deadly products on people. We're not going to let you do that anymore. The company ended up in bankruptcy. Um, you, you can't survive in the long term as a company if you're trying to push products that damage people or the planet. Related to that, one of our listeners asked a question that is an interesting one, and it has to do with quality products and pricing wars and the challenge we still have about so many products made that don't last very long, that fall apart, that can't be repaired. Any discussion going on about the sort of obligation that companies have to make products that really can be sustainable and last a long time? Yeah, I, I think right now there's a lot of discussion around that. I mean, let me just give you an example. Uh, uh, Jim Fitterling is currently the CEO of Dow Chemical. I've gotten to know him pretty well. He's running a petrochemical company, right? Uh, and he's producing plastic, most of which isn't being recycled. But I can tell you from a number of conversations, he's spending... He told me he's now spending the majority of his time working on either environmental projects or circular economy projects. How do we create, uh, how do we turn this into an industry that can be sustained because the products that we're pro producing can be reused? Now, they're not making a huge amount of progress, but just judging by the amount of time and energy and effort he's putting into it, I think he's sincere. I think he feels like for the long-term interest of Dow, this is the way he should be spending his time. And, and, and that's that's just very different. I, I mean, there are other examples like that. Uh, there's a man by the name of Sven uh, Tor Holsether, who is the CEO of Yara, which is one of the world's uh, largest producers of fertilizer, um, which obviously is uh, has questionable impact on sustainability over the long run. <laughs> It's another example of somebody who has told me, and just watching him, I, I believe it, spends the majority of his time on stakeholder issues. How do we reduce the environmental impact? You know, How do we feed the world, but reduce the environmental impact of farming? How do we, uh, you know, how do we make sure that we're creating enough food for the billions who, who need it, but also dealing with the environmental catastrophe that's that's coming. So I, I, you know, the skeptics will say, oh, this is all greenwashing, it's all PR campaigns, it's just talk. But I, I know too many of these people who are really devoting an enormous amount of their time and energy, not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because they believe that's what they need to do for the long-term interests of their company. Yeah. Are they actively trying to influence their peers? Because you know, you've know you come across some, some visionary leaders. I've been lucky enough to work for Paul Pullman at Unilever. And one of the things that I worry about is, are they going to influence other leaders who don't quite see the world the way they do? So what I'm confident of I mean, you were an early adopter and that probably creates a certain amount of frustration on your part because it seemed like a pretty lonely band uh, back there in 2008 and 2009. What I am confident of is that the band is growing pretty rapidly. And when I say the band, I'm talking about the band of people who sincerely feel this is fundamental to the success of their company. Um, so, and, and I think Paul Pullman would agree with that. The, the band is growing. The question I can answer is, is it growing fast enough to deal with the magnitude of the problems uh, and to convince people that the current system can solve those problems? Yeah. 
And I think that's a critical question because by many indications, we're not moving quick enough. By many indications, we are engaged in a vast array of good projects that aren't bringing fish back to the sea, that aren't slowing climate change, that aren't preventing quickly enough so soil erosion. And, you know, that, that will present a real challenge to many companies. I mean, if you're in the business of selling fertilizer and there's no soil left to grow any crops on, then that's not a very good business no any longer. No question. I would say I'm I'm probably a little more optimistic than you are. I mean, I mean we're we're a long way away from moving fast enough to solve the climate problem to take one example. And yet, if you look at what's happened in the US and and uh Europe over the course of the last decade or two, it's it's pretty significant. Uh and you know, when I see a CEO like Mary Barra, the CEO of GM, come out like she did in January of 2021 and say, my company will not will only make non-emitting vehicles by 2035, which, as you know, in, in the automobile business, the kind of investment you have to make for the next generation of cars, 2035 is not very far away. So for her to make that commitment, even though right now there's hardly, an, there's certainly not enough demand for electric vehicles to justify that commitment, uh, that that tells me that something significant is going on out there. No, I can, no. I, I, you know, I'm pretty convinced that every important decision that gets made at GM these days has to be made with that commitment in mind. It has transformed the company, and and they are moving ahead of society. Uh, other other leaders like that that are taking a transformational role in their industry and its future that you came across in writing the book? Yeah, I've mentioned a couple of them. Sventor Holsether at Yara in the fertilizer industry, Jim Fitterling at Dow in the uh, petrochemicals industry. Um, uh, you know, you see they're, they're, they're leaders in the tech industry. I mean, the tech industry isn't... Uh, isn't as dirty as some of these, but but it's not that clean either when you think about the impact of computing. So you look at what Satya Nadella is doing at Microsoft. Um, an interesting example uh, uh, that I mentioned in the book is Dan Shulman at PayPal, who uh, employed, Dan, Dan employed large numbers of, of low paid people in his call centers and around the world. And uh, PayPal's way of paying people in those call centers was pretty much the way any capitalist would have used, which is you go into a city, you look at the prevailing wage, and maybe you pay a little bit more than the prevailing wage because you want good people and you wanted to stay. But what you pay them is based on the prevailing wage in that city. And what Dan said was, well, wait a minute. You know, we need to know that we're providing these people with a living wage. And he actually went through the trouble of kind of figuring out, okay, you know, after you pay for food and shelter, what is a disposable income that you need to be free from panic about how you're going to survive every day? Came up with his own uh, definition and changed the pay structure to pay based on that rather than the prevailing wage in in the re region. I think that was kind of a visionary approach uh, to uh, thinking about these problems. That your employees are not a commodity. You you don't treat them as a a com as being in a commodity market. You've actually amazingly seen some of that at Walmart. I mean, uh, Sam Walton started that company with a with a mandate to just beat down the price of every input, including labor. Uh, and Doug McMillan, who's the current CEO, has changed that thinking pretty dramatically. He said, "No, wait a minute. Our associates are not an input." Uh, it's not like buying, you know, buying uh, products for the shelves, and we got to think differently about how we compensate them. So, um, anyway, I, I, as you can see, I get carried away when you ask me these questions. I think there's a lot going on. I can't tell you that enough is going on, but I, but there is a lot going on, and and the direction and the acceleration is all in the right direction. And what can we do as fellow businessmen, as consumers, as investors 
to accelerate and encourage some of these positive inclinations and yeah. development? That's a great question, Jeffrey. And look, I, I'm a journalist at heart. And so whenever I've heard these stories from CEOs over the last 10 years, I've said, why are you doing this? And I can tell you the first answer is always because my employees want me to. So employees are doing a lot and, and they should never underestimate their power in the company in a, in a, in a economy where value comes from talent talented employees have enormous influence and so that's one part as an employee you can influence the behavior of, of your company you're starting to see more activity among consumers but this is a space you know better than i do i'm not sure we've quite reached the point where most consumers are willing to actually pay to help the environment or help other social goals it's we're you know some elite consumers at the high end maybe you know if you're buying patagonia products but it's it's not widespread and then you're starting to see it among investors and i think that's very interesting the problem but this gets back to the accountability and measurement problem i've been told that 40 percent of the funds invested today are invested through some kind of an esg screen but i think we all know that those esg screens are often bullshit and we just had a very dramatic example they invaded what was the company uh, in in germany the asset manager who, who got invaded by the authorities uh uh because they were allegedly they were uh, uh faking their esg numbers so it's really important that that everyone push for the development of metrics and standards of accountability and for disclosure so that we can begin to hold companies accountable for these promises that they're making. Yeah. We have a question that came in from one of the individuals in the audience. And uh, the question is about companies fulfilling their initial commitments around racial equity and income inequality and particularly race, racial wealth equity. We saw, just like we're seeing now around net zero, we saw a tremendous number of commitments around racial equity and some, some pretty strong suggestions that the number of dollars that were put on the table have not gotten distributed. I don't know about the last one, dollars put on the table, not, go, not gotten distributed. I do believe that a number of companies have taken more serious steps uh, in the last two years than they had previous to that. And what do I mean by serious steps? Well, you know, diversity, I, I mean, for many industries, it just became a game of bidding up the, the cost of the same little pool of talent. Uh, as opposed to figuring out how do we actually expand the pool of talent. And now I see much more attention on the latter. Um, and that's what the one, uh, 110 initiative that uh, uh, Ken Frazier, the, the uh, CEO of Merck, and Ken Chenault, the former CEO of American Express, came up with. They said, we're going to get a bunch of companies to commit to hiring a million uh, a, a million." Uh, American Blacks from disadvantaged situations. So how do you do that? Uh, one thing is to rethink your job requirements. Instead of uh, asking for a four-year degree for every job, think hard about, gosh, do I really need a four-year degree or are there some non-traditional sources of labor that I can go to here? Another is apprenticeships. Uh, can I hire people who maybe don't quite have the skills that I need for this job right now? but who are eminently trainable and I can commit to training them up. Um, and, I, and I can tell you some companies that I've talked to, uh, you know, companies like Accenture, Hyatt Hotels, uh, uh, Allstate, a number of others, there's a whole group of them in the Chicago area, will tell you that it's been a very successful strategy because they actually create increased loyalty among those employees, greater loyalty among those employees than more uh, educated and prepared employees they bring in. So, uh, so I, 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 I see much more serious efforts being made right now to create alternative um, uh, pipelines to bringing talent into companies. But again, 
Jeffrey, the question is, is it moving fast enough uh, to meet the magnitude of the problem? I think the answer is still probably no. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to sort of go at this again, but the people running these large companies are very smart people who have a tremendous amount of experience and some of them may be even quite enlightened from the perspective of their moral obligations to societies. But in many cases, whether it's climate or whether it's race, there is this persistent gap between what's needed and what is being put forward by most companies. What do we do about that gap? That gap is a dangerous gap for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it, it, it really comes down to a question of scalability. So, okay, there are all these interesting things going on, but how do you scale them? You know, I think when you get to scalability, you end up back with government. Like, how do you create effective public-private partnerships that can take these interesting programs to scale? Uh, um, whether it's through disclosure requirements or... Uh, subsidies, you know, something like worker training, we used to think of as a government responsibility. I mean, back in the 1980s, trade adjustment assistance was money that came from the government to retrain people who lost their jobs because of, of trade shifts. Uh, I don't think we think of that as a government responsibility anymore, in part because government's not very good at it and companies are better at it. But providing some government support for that providing maybe some government funding for that. I, I, I think that's that would help a lot to get the to get things to scale. Same in climate. I mean, we all know we all know what the right public policy here is, right? It's to put a put a price on carbon, to have a some sort of a, a carbon tax. Uh, that will drive all kinds of solutions. If if you actually have to pay for the cost of your polluting, you will act differently. So, and, and business leaders know that too. And I know a number of uh, people who run large companies who would support that. So this gets back to like, who's keeping that from happening. It's just not gonna happen in the current polarized environment. Yeah. That's a scary, a, 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 a scary situation because we can't allow this to persist. I mean, we, we really need to figure out a better way to make this happen. I, I think, that gets, I think get, that gets to something you said earlier. Uh, particularly during the pandemic, CEOs have accumulated uh, significant trust. Uh, there's a poll done regularly by uh, Richard Edelman that shows that uh, companies, corporate leaders, business leaders are more trusted than government leaders, certainly than journalists or even NGO leaders. And my employer in particular has a higher degree of trust. And so the question is, can they use some of that trust to help fix the political problem? Because if we don't fix the political problem at the end of the day, I just don't know that we can fix the problems. Yeah. So. As we sort of move towards the end of this conversation, I'm, I'm interested in, in two things. What do you worry about most and what makes you most hopeful? What I worry about most is what we were just talking about, which is that while I see good things going on, they may not be happening quickly enough to deal with the magnitude of the problem and the acceleration of the, of the problem. Um, and, and in large part, that's driven by the complete dysfunction of our political system. What, what makes me hopeful is the incredible inventiveness of business and capitalism. I mean, I, at the end of the day, you know, you just have to marvel at what our system has accomplished. I mean, think about it. We've, we've raised a billion people out of poverty around the world over the course of the last 50 years. Um, uh, no, that's never before happened in history. And, and the climate challenge requires some massive technological breakthroughs. But when you look at what companies are doing to try and meet that challenge, it's pretty impressive. And, and I'll leave you with one last example of this that, that I think we should not forget. Uh, 
two years ago, you wouldn't have found anybody, anybody who would have believed that we could uh, design, manufacture, and distribute a vaccine to a brand new virus in two years' time. Nobody would have believed that. I mean, the best that history had to offer was like a 10-year time frame. And, and that's, that's, I mean, there's a little bit of government activity in the distribution part and maybe a little bit of forward purchases, but that's an incredible testament to the ingenuity of business. Uh, and, and that's what makes me hopeful. I think, I think we will look, when, when you reach moments of despair right now, uh, my guess is we will look back in 20 years and say, oh, geez, that did feel pretty bad. But look at this great breakthrough that happened that, that changed the dynamics. It could be uh, in hydrogen fuel. Uh, it could be in battery storage. It could be in uh, cold fusion. You know, who knows where it's going to come from? But my guess is 10, 20 years down the road, we will have seen some amazing innovations that will have helped us address these problems. That was wonderful, Alan. Thank you so much <clears throat> for sharing all those insights. And, and for people who want to hear and, and understand what's going on at some of these larger companies and hear some stories that you, you haven't read about before, please check out uh, Alan's terrific new book, Tomorrow's Capitalism, My Search for the Soul of Business. You'll enjoy it. I have and uh, encourage you all to pick up a copy. And Alan, thank you so much for uh, sharing some time with us today, sharing some insights from someone who has a pretty remarkable career spread across business and politics. Uh, you, you have a unique vantage point from which to think about these challenges we're facing and uh, shed some, some light on them. So thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue in the future. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's, it's all my pleasure. It was great fun. Thank you. Thanks.